Well, good evening and welcome, and I, I want to thank everyone for coming to the Presidential Salon panel discussion on engineering and precision medicine, and today it's presented by the Rensselaer, Texas Triangle Executive Council. We're really pleased to have you here. We're thrilled to be back in Texas, and there's a lot, th a lot of things happening in the different cities, primarily in Houston, Austin, and Dallas, and we're really excited to be a part of it. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Miller, the class of 1980, who's the co-chair of the Rensselaer Texas Triangle Executive Council. Michael, please come and join us. Sure. All right. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. For those of you who may, who may not be familiar with the Rensselaer Regional Executive Councils, there are five located in key geographic regions. Um, where there are engaged alumni and parents. Our own council is the newest one to be established, joining four others, which are in Silicon Valley, the greater New York area, New England, and then New York's uh, state's capital region. These councils were created <clears throat> to strengthen connections and offer opportunities for engagement for alumni, parents, and the Rensselaer community with each of these regions. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you here today in person. If you'd like to learn more about the regional executive councils, there's a handout available um, somewhere in back with more information. And I'm personally happy to connect with uh, anyone who has any questions and wants to learn more and potentially get involved. I now have the pleasure of introducing the Honorable Dr. Shirley Jackson um, as the moderator of today's conversation. Um, as a result of Dr. Jackson's strategic leadership since her arrival to Rensselaer in 1999, she's had numerous accomplishments that have truly transformed the Institute. During her tenure, Dr. Jackson has overseen the successful completion of a $1.4 billion capital campaign and is currently leading the second uh, capital campaign where the halfway mark towards the $1 billion goal has been surpassed and the Institute's endowment has reached the $1 billion mark. Dr. Tran Dr. Jackson is focused on truly transforming the student experience by envisioning the award-winning concept of class, which is clustered learning, advocacy, and support for students and bringing it to life. Hmm, my page is stuck. She's received, <laughs> she's received numerous national and international awards, including the National Medal of Science, the United States' highest honor for achievement in science and engineering. Most recently, she was named the 2021 recipient of the American Association of Physics Teachers um, Ersted Medal and the FBI Director's Community Leadership Award. Dr. Jackson continues to represent Rensselaer across the globe through participation in international events, including the World Economic Forum, truly elevating the global presence of the Institute. And most recently, Dr. Jackson has led the Institute through a global pandemic with safety of our students, faculty, and staff on campus as the absolute priority, resulting in one of the lowest infection rates in the nation. So let's please welcome the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the Honorable Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. And uh, you, you will be missed. Well, maybe I can say that I once was honorable anyway. But thank you, Michael, that's great. And let me welcome our alumni, alumnae, executive council members, and parents who are joining us this evening, and of course, our trustees. And so I'm always pleased to be in Texas, and I was here not too long ago, except I was in Austin. And we have more than 3,500 uh, Rensselaer alumni, alumnae, parents uh, in and around Texas. And this is our uh, second panel discussion this year in Texas following one we did have just last month in Austin. I'm also pleased to introduce uh, uh, members of our board and institute leaders who are joining us uh, this evening. We're very fortunate that Mr. Uh, Jeff Kodosky uh, and his wife, Gail, uh, uh, Jeff has been a longtime partner and friend of the institute. I met him at the very beginning of my tenure, and he's been such a great supporter. And he is, in fact, um, you know, uh, co-chair of the Rensselaer Texas Triangle Executive Council. And the triangle uh, comprises Austin, Houston, and Dallas. So in case you're wondering, 
I don't think it's an isosceles triangle, but here we go. <laughs> We're also pleased that uh, Mr. T.J. Wojner, who also is a member of our Board of Tr Trustees, is also with us. Where's T.J.? There he is. Um, and I'd also like to introduce to you Dr. Keith Mu Young. Uh, Keith, Keith is vice. Uh, he is the uh, vice chair of the Rensselaer Texas Triangle Executive Council, and he is vice provost for undergraduate education at the institute. And we're thrilled to welcome these special guests. And I have to uh, recognize my partner in crime, uh, Mr. Greg Easton. There he is. I can't live without him. So we're here today for a conversation, a conversation with Institute and industry leaders whom you will meet shortly on the rapidly advancing fields of engineering and precision medicine and the opportunity these fields offer together. And first, let me set the stage and, and give you an overview of four other key research initiatives that the Board of Trustees has endorsed and uh, expect that our new president will, will carry through. And we believe that they are all interconnected and have relevance in addressing the global challenges we face today and in the future. And these four initiatives, and plus the one we'll be talking about, are being implemented uh, through the establishment of new centers uh, or institutes that align with our existing signature research thrusts and encompass our collective expertise, our uh, knowledge and critical partnerships across the institute and around the globe. Now, the first initiative is the establishment of the Institute for Energy, the Built Environment and Smart Systems, or EBIS which focuses on the challenge of urban growth. And even though uh, we think people have left cities, if you look globally, uh, the, the world is still urbanizing. And we're looking at the ability to anticipate, investigate, and mitigate the effects of, uh, of carbon emissions and importantly, climate change, yet not sacrificing energy security and a focus on uh, human health and well-being. And so EBUS focuses on viewing each environment, urban environment, as a system of systems in order to achieve a collective multi-scale intelligence to uh, benefit all. And it brings together our schools of architecture and engineering, as well as policymakers uh, in partnership with the Brooklyn Law School. And we focus on uh, how we can uh, take out energy intensity but build in climate resilience through the use of advanced uh, technologies to devise new materials and, and building platforms that are more intelligent, uh, using more data, data analytics, and to model and design cities with integrated transportation, communications, and supply chain networks. Now, the second uh, research initiative is what we call the Global Freshwater Institute, which is an aspirational goal, which will address the challenges of climate change, pollution, and the overuse of freshwater systems and its effect with cascading consequences. Now, this institute, in fact, will build upon the work we've done through the Jefferson Project, which is located uh, on Lake George in New York, about 65 miles north of the Rensselaer campus, and it's located at the Darren Freshwater Institute, which we've had for some number of years. Now, in case you're wondering why it's called the Jefferson Project, it's because Thomas Jefferson actually visited Lake George, and he called it the most beautiful water he ever saw. And so when we started out to do this, we simply called it the Jefferson Project. And we believe we've made Lake George the smartest lake in the world with LIDAR imaging, uh, with in-lake mesocosms to do biological and, and chemistry experiments, with uh, 500 sensors on 51 platforms in and around the lake, including weather stations, uh, Doppler measurements, et cetera. And of course, through the use of uh, advanced visualization techniques and sophisticated data analytics. And so the Institute is going to now expand in two ways expand geographically. We've been invited by the governor of New York to take the knowledge and the uh, experience we've gained 
from Lake George to other lakes in the Adirondacks, including Skaneateles Lake and, and Chautauqua. And as such, then the Ta Chautauqua Institute is becoming a major partner and supporting what we do. And then our, our board has asked us to look at moving to the west, uh, out to Lake Tahoe. And in the end, the point is to create a platform that's exportable and that can look at freshwater systems and even marine systems anyway, anywhere rather. And the other expansion is that we're expanding the scientific work to look more specifically at understanding stressors in the microbiome of harmful algal blooms and, and what causes those blooms at a genomic level to become toxic. And the toxins that can be formed can have dermatological effects, gastrointestinal effects, and neurological effects. Now, the third initiative is both its own entity and a true underpinning for the support of our other initiatives, and that's the establishment of the Data Artificial Intelligence and Computation, or DAKE Institute, which will examine new comp uh, computational paradigms to allow us to address more complex challenges. This, it builds on strength we already have developed in data science and data analytics, in quantum and neuromorphic computing, and in AI-enabled high-performance computing uh, with our uh, supercomputer center. Um, and we like to claim we have the most powerful supercomputer at any private university. We know that Texas has a powerful system, but you guys are, you know, <laughs> state-supported. But it also <clears throat> involves AI-driven gamification in immersive uh, virtual and augmented reality environments, and all of that undergirded, of course, by that computational ecosystem. And the fourth initiative is one that focuses on uh, advanced chip design and manufacturing. And we're positioning to, uh, we hope to win a National Science and Technology uh, Center that's focused on advanced uh, chip manufacturing. And we have certain uh, advantages. We're partnering with uh, our longtime partner, IBM, but also with MIT, a number of other uh, universities, and as, as well as a number of other uh, enterprises in that uh, business. And so uh, it'll be very exciting, and it builds on work and capabilities that we have developed over the years in heterogeneous and 3D packaging, as, as well as uh, interconnects. And then our fifth initiative, as well as the reason that we're all here today, is the establishment of the Center for Engineering and Precision Medicine which is a, a partnership uh, with the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, which is, uh, interestingly enough, a standalone, very highly ranked um, uh, medical school, and, and uh, we're quite excited about it. And this center will be formally and publicly launched in May. And the Board of Trustees has already approved a resolution establishing this center. And uh, Dennis Charney, who's the dean of the medical school and I, uh, through a hybrid means, uh, signed off on the establishment of that center in the presence of witnesses, our board of trustees, and the leadership team. Now, this is a major expansion in our biomedical and clinical uh, research, and in biomedical and clinical research more broadly. And again, it builds out from the work we've done uh, uh, with the establishment of our Center for Biotechnology, and interdisciplinary studies, where we started with essentially nothing, and we've built that into a major research center. And this specifically, uh, this center is going to be in New York City. And it's going to be uh, specifically, for those of you who may be familiar, on West 54th Street, nearby the Mount Sinai West Hospital, which is formerly the Roosevelt Hospital, and it is adjacent, adjacent to several of Mount Sinai's new research labs. Now, the CEPM, as we describe it, uh, focuses on, obviously, disease mitigation and improvements to human health through precision medicine, uh, which creates you know, more patient-specific treatments and more targeted treatments. And it'll involve point-of-care and point-of-use devices and diagnostics, 
but also microphysiological platforms for discovery and, and diagnosis. Of course, robotic surgery, but importantly, biomedical imaging and the use of AI and machine learning applied to biomedical data. But it also is going to be uh, looking at what we you might think of as, is it cellular engineering, where uh, that we really are taking the, the engineering uh, approach undergirded by fundamental science from the uh, cellular to the patient level. And so we're going to be focusing the work around three pillars, uh, neuroengineering for minimally invasive control and regulation of neural cir circuitry. And this is exciting because one of the real standout strengths of Mount Sinai is in fact in, uh, in uh, neuroscience and, and uh, uh, medicine uh, related to um, uh, neurological uh, diseases. Also immunoengineering to help our bodies fight cancer and infectious diseases and what we refer to as regenerative and reparative medicine, uh, looking at uh, personalized tissue repair and regeneration, again, uh, focusing uh, at you know, the stem cell and other cellular levels. And so with the center, we also are creating a doctoral program in engineering and precision medicine that will enable students to earn joint, dual, or individual doctorates from Mount Sinai and Rensselaer, and we are hiring faculty for this center. We'll be hiring faculty, Mount Sinai, who will be jointly uh, in the center. And so that leads me naturally to introduce our distinguished panelists for today's discussion. Uh, you ask them all the hard questions. I'll give them the softball ones as we get started. And I'm going to uh, read you their names and titles, but the titles they have is an introduction in and of itself but please read more about their tremendous accomplishments in the event program. Now, our own Dr. Jonathan Dordick, and John, please come forward, is a special advisor to the president on strategic initiatives and institute professor of chemical and biological engineering, biomedical engineering, and biological sciences. And, this, and his research group focuses on gaining a quantitative understanding of biological principles and applying them to advance the fields of biomanufacturing, biocatalysis, and new human cell culture platforms for drug discovery. Now, Dr. Dordick previously was our vice president for research, as well as the, uh, one of the early directors of our Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies. And uh, I must uh, take a moment and say part of the reason that we've done as well as we have in managing through the uh, global pandemic at the university and that we were able to open back up relatively early, it's because we established a protocol that we called t cubed SQI, uh, testing, tracing, tracking, uh, surveillance, quarantine, and isolation. And so we have a comprehensive program, but it rests with having a licensed PCR-based testing lab. And it's a lab set up in John's lab, and, but it shows what it means to have a world-class uh, researcher uh, on our faculty who then works with our health director, student health director, who all then work with our vice president for research, who happens to be on the board of a, a capital region health center, uh, health uh, system, and all of that came together for us to have this licensed uh, center. But also, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Zahi Fayad, Fayad, and he and I've <laughs> talked for a number of years. We talked about how, uh, with John, with others, and even with our, uh, between ourselves, uh, getting this whole thing going. And he has had quite a distinguished career. He is director of the Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Institute as well as being professor of diagnostic molecular and interventional radiology and professor of medicine in cardiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, which is our partner in this new center. His research has focused on the detection and prevention of cardiovascular disease. And if we keep eating those snacks, we're all gonna be his patient. <laughs> 
So <laughs> welcome, Dr. Dordek and Fayed, and thank you for joining us. So now we'll begin our discussion, and I'll chat with them for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll open it to questions from, from all of them. So let me pose a question to, oh, I have to turn on my mic. I don't follow instructions very well. <laughs> so before we discuss specifically the future of engineering and precision medicine and the opportunities of the field, let's cover what that concept currently uh, means and where it stands, as well as the challenges and opportunities it represents. And so could each of you share how you, what you see as some of the challenges and opportunities in these areas? And, and maybe Dr. Fayyad, we'll start with you because yeah. you're right on the firing line. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy, happy to be there. And maybe we can talk about nutrition and how we precision. Nutrition can be helpful uh, <laughs> uh, to avoid uh, the cardiovascular disease or stroke. So, so yeah, today, I mean, I think we are really at that, at that juncture of, of this inflection point. And we have tools. It's not, we're not coming in with no tools in terms of precision medicine. There have been a revolution in genomics. You know, we, we, we have that. Uh, we have ways to, to detect disease non-invasively, uh, being used in the clinic, you know, to help detect cancer, let's say, at, at some molecular level. We have been benefiting from all the revolution happenings in data analytics and now integrating this into the practice of medicine. However, we're really at early days. Screening is not being done. We are not into this area of prevention of medicine. In medicine. The AI tools have not been fully validated. They could be mistakes. They could be errors. They could be biases. So we, and then finally, if you want to think about other areas, you know, mentioned in terms of regeneration, stem cell therapy, some things, but has not really led to that to that promise yet. So these are the challenges we have, and that's why you know we need to go to the next level. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dordic, um, you know, precision medicine is increasingly being used in genetic disease therapy and management, uh, in cancer therapy and immunotherapy. But where do you see the frontiers at this specific interface of, of engineering and medicine that will further drive this whole area and, and maybe address some of the things yeah. that Dr. Fayed <clears throat> talked about? So, you know, I, th I think one area that has received a lot of interest and, and people learned about it is, uh, is actually in immunoengineering, and in particular, uh, how we can take advantage of a very patient-specific approach. For example, CAR-T therapy, which is uh, used in leukemias, other uh, uh, non-solid cancers at this point. And <clears throat> this will give you an idea of where the engineering actually plays a major role. In order to actually do this, so what happens is that the T cells from a patient are, are taken out from that patient, they're engineered, and then they're put back into the body. Uh, and that engineer, engineering allows the T cells to recognize cancer cells, for example. So the challenge is that in, in order to do that, you have to be able to, of course, take the cells and separate them and do that. So that, the technologies exist quite well for that. Uh, but then you have to have a viral vector that actually is used. So you use a virus that's suitably modified so it doesn't become dangerous. Uh, and in order to do that, you actually have to scale it up. And if you have even one patient, the amount of scale up needed uh, is kind of reaching the limit of what we can easily do in a single site. And, and that's just for one patient. Um, and then you, know, you have to do the work to, to make sure that it's actually purified and so forth. And so that's where the engineering comes in. It's on the upstream side and in making these viral vectors that have exactly what you want in them. It's on the downstream side to purify them so you don't have other stuff that could be dangerous. It's, uh, and then, of course, therapeutically, you have to make sure that you don't have any, because it's a gene therapy, you don't have something that might be too long term and then become a, a problem. And all of this is an example of things that are already out there, and yet the engineering aspects just have not been resolved. 
So now we're moving into hospitals. I'm sure Sinai is looking at this, essentially doing their own scale up, their own becoming their own biomanufacturing organization to do this. Uh, and and so it's very distributed. <clears throat> and so there will be supply chain issues that relate to this as well. And so this, this really falls beautifully into an example of where the principles of engineering can be applied to something of fundamentally, fundamental importance in biomedicine and then linking the two together. And so that's an example of what is now done, but there are some significant hurdles where engineering and medicine come together. And it's very precise because it's at the actual patient level. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because even though we're talking things at the patient level, but you're talking about ma manipulating things at the cellular level, uh, a lot of the most advanced uh, technologies that are relevant to precision medicine is precision imaging. And so, Dr. Fayad, this is where you come in, particularly with the advancement in imaging techniques with artificial intelligence, yep. Yep. visualization algorithms. Yep. And, and hopefully that creates less likelihood of mistakes. Yep. And so how is precision imaging progressing and how is it being used in practice today? Yeah, yeah. so maybe we can you know, break it down into two aspects. You know, what would be the impact of artificial intelligence? You know, we're not gonna go into the different derivative like machine learning or deep learning or unsupervised learning. But all these techniques, I mean, one of the, if you look at the medicine and which, what discipline of medicine is going to be, is being disrupted today, is really the aspect of what we call pattern recognition. That's what a radiologist does, do. They look at pictures and they recognize patterns of disease. Number one, it is becoming more and more difficult because this sheer number of images that a radiologist has to ingest because the computers are so fast now. The images are becoming so much powerful. The number of images is unsustainable. So errors happen. Yeah. Not at Mount Sinai, but errors happen. <laughs> uh, but also there is really, I mean, there have been a survey done in the UK, but I think it can also apply to as the aspect of burnout. Not only in general physician, but really in the radiologist because of that information that they're getting. So that, that, this is where the help is going to be. We're not going to replace the radiologist by AI algorithm. You mentioned this, we're going to augment yes. the physician. John's talk about scaling up in terms of material or processes, but also in general in healthcare, we cannot sustain this healthcare system at, at that scale. It has, they, they need to be software involved into it to take it in. That's, not, that's number one. That's more of an operational aspect, but obviously has an impact in terms of what we discussed. The second aspect is recognize certain diseases that are not recognizable even with the best radiology, with the best training, because there are patterns that are there that a computer can uncover. They don't need to go to, to, to have a radiology residency to do this, but they, are being, they have algorithm that trains them and they recognize certain patterns that you cannot recognize. So this is where that precision comes and we sh should be able to use our current imaging techniques, but now let them reveal what we call secrets that we cannot see. And this, the third part is actually changing maybe the whole way we acquire images. Now I'm not talking about pattern recognition, but I'm, not, I'm talking about what we call image acquisition or image reconstruction. Mm. So you could speed up that brain MRI that takes today 20 minutes. Maybe you could do the exam with five. Why? Because now I'm gonna have a new algorithm that does not need to take the data at full resolution, but maybe takes the data at one quarter resolution. We do this in video compression when we send images, et cetera. So this is where the aspect of now changing actually the whole instrument and, the, and, and that data that comes in. So that, that I think is a very powerful, and we're starting to see this. I mean, we have multiple, I mean, maybe the most number of companies with FDA AI product, doesn't mean that they bring in value yet, is actually in the field of radiology. So they're all being now tested, and they will be, it's a little bit of the Wild West. I mean, Texas, we have to talk about that Wild West. <laughs> uh, but eventually that, that's going to converge. And, and I do see the, the, the aspect of, engineering principles that are going to help us in this matter. Yeah. Right, as so well I as, I, I no, you that did, as, well, yeah. as well as literal engineering mm -hmm. at, at the cellular mm -hmm. level. 
But if we talk about sustainability, then we, we really do have to talk about the cost of drug discovery and development, yeah. Yeah. which I think is now approaching three billion yeah. per approved drug. Yeah. So for a more precision therapeutic, uh, with smaller numbers of patients per designed drug, yeah. you know, the revenue <coughs> and the economics for pharma or biopharma companies uh, doesn't look particularly favorable. So what ch uh, changes, John? Uh, sorry, Dr. Dorty. Uh, you know, what no, changes? No problem, Shirley. The, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we got to get real here. And so, so you know, what changes <laughs> to the uh, critical path of, of drug development and, and regulatory paths yeah. are needed to ensure that, that precision medicine yeah. is feasible now across make, a broader range of diseases? Make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> So you're right. I mean, it, it, you're looking at uh, for new drugs, true new drugs, not a modification of one or, or a new uh, formulation, but a new drug. You know, you're looking two and a half to three billion dollars to get the drug from inception to, you know, from discovery and development to the market. And keep in mind that uh, given the patent coverage, that's 20 years since the time you file a patent, which is going to be early because you don't want somebody else to come in. <clears throat> By the time you're and if it takes 12 years to 15 years to get the drug actually all the way through, you know, you, you need to get a lot, have a lot of return very quickly over a period of three to five years. Uh, and so, you know, that's why the blockbuster model of a billion or more per drug uh, per year is, is what pharma has looked at. So now you take a look at a truly precision approach, and it won't be necessarily to the patient per se, but to groups of patients that have a very similar genetic background, for example, or the nature of their disease is very similar, so a given drug can be treat, can used to treat them. So your numbers have dropped dramatically. Okay, so let's just increase the cost by a factor of five to 10. Well, now we're under a lot of cost pressures too, so how do you do that? <clears throat> so the other way to do it, uh, which is problematic, is you say, well, I'm going to then take a given area as a pharma company, and I'm going to divide the drugs down into three, four, five different drugs for the same group of what would have been all the patients for one drug. And so, okay, that then you would have a little bit you have more precision on that, which is fine. However, you now need to get each one through the FDA, and so each one's going to cost Maybe not three billion because you're cutting down to some extent on you know economy of scale, but maybe it's two billion dollars, uh, and that's impossible because now over five drugs that's ten billion dollars. Nobody's going to do it, uh, and so what has to happen? Well, number one, new technologies are being developed to get you faster to the clinic, uh, faster through the FDA process. The FDA has got to fundamentally change. They can't keep asking for the same kind of tests that were done in the 1980s and 90s uh, today. So that has to change. We can use, and we are using AI, broadly termed AI tools, to give an idea of what patients should be in the clinical trial. Yeah. So that means your clinical trials can be much, much smaller. Uh, and the data that you're getting out, because we have greater precision in the analyses, whether it be imaging or molecular tests, are much more precise and can be done earlier. In the, so we don't even have to go through all the different tests, we can learn a lot very early on about the effectiveness and the toxicity of the different drugs. And if you're looking at biopharmaceuticals, which are uh, generally going to, you know, they're going to be, you know, potentially the, your own uh, proteins, your own antibodies and, and other, uh, you know, biological molecules in, in your body, uh, then there will be faster routes that that can ultimately get to the clinic. Uh, and so I think that's going to lead to a reduction in cost, but it needs, it needs the implementation of the new technologies that are now coming on board. It needs the ability to get things through the regulatory agencies more quickly without sacrificing, of course, safety, which is the primary concern. Uh, and it needs the pharma companies to reclassify their risk reward. Uh, and, and that's not easy either. Small companies do this all the time, uh, and pharma's already essentially farmed out the early stages of discovery right. and development to small companies. Uh, but 
Now it's going to, you know, this could impact the ability of the small companies to remain viable. So there's a lot of questions that need to come uh, and go through. We've learned from this pandemic that our regulatory agencies have been both good and bad. And we know both examples. Uh, and so, um, you know, we need to really rethink how we eventually get more personalized therapeutics and therapies to the patient. So Dr. Fai, at our, our Center for Engineering and Precision Medicine sits at this unique interface of the biological sciences, engineering sciences, uh, with clinical mm -hmm. translation. And so we've talked about uh, the focus on neuro, immuno, yep. and, and, and regenerative and reparative medicine. But you're an engineer yourself. Absolutely. Uh, Electrical a, and biomedical, both. Yep. Within a clinical uh, enterprise. Then what are the most critical gaps that have to be filled in order to really drive the next generation of, of yeah. new technologies yeah. for you know, better patient treatment and outcomes? Yeah. yeah so, so as, as you said, I obviously trained as an engineer you know, and then came to 25 years at Mount Sinai you know, to build this and to be close to the clinic. And really, there was really the desire that I, you know, you know, intended to have as well as the other faculty member that I recruited. And we really have that fluidity in terms of being able to be an engineer, but have the next door to us, you know, physicians. Either they knock on our door or we knock on their door. But there is that exchange and there's that appetite in order, you know, the physician would come say, I have this problem, I know I need engineering solution to solve it. So we created that, but I've also learned during the time that we do need to take it to the next level. And that's why we, team, we are teaming up here with, with, with Rensselaer to be able to take now these engineering principles that John has said. And we know that the next revolution in, in biomedical engineering, but in medicine is going to be through this, to the engineering principles. It's been tested, you know, maybe pilot tested, but we see that. The technology is becoming really the key, and the engineering is becoming key to these next advancements. So let's talk a few examples. You mentioned neuromodulation, yes. right? Neuromodulation, and that's, that's a big problem. I mean, although it's, it's been, they've been telling us it's a century of the brain, and we go in, but when I talk to and we hear from actually our dean, who's a psychiatrist, our CEO, who's also a psychiatrist, they talk about the gap in treatments. They say these medicine have been discovered in 1950s, and we're still trying to figure out how to treat depression, how to treat you know, people with neuropsychiatric diseases. What's happening? I mean, what, what is going on in here? So that's, we know there is a gap. I mean, there's a huge gap in the neuro, neurological diseases. It's major killers, right, in terms of if you look at what is killing people, you know, second maybe, in terms of causes of, 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 of death and, and problems. So neuromodulation, they, a lot of interesting work happening through engineering principle. One is called deep brain stimulation. So you take areas of the brain and you stimulate them to solve motor disorders. Technique now really taking uh, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, now part of the aspect of being used. They use also focus ultrasound, and again, through, through engineering principles to be able to guide and to get to these areas of the brain circuitry that you need to, to, need to modulate. We're even looking at it in aspect of depression and anxiety. However, we're still missing precision. So we, we're trying to map the area of the brain that needs to be focused on. We still don't have good. We don't have good instruments. We don't have MRI compatible devices because MRI is gonna give us really high resolution, but we need to have these devices in the brain, so they need to be MRI compatible. We need to use algorithm like AI and image processing to be able to tell the surgeon, you know what, focus on this area. This is what you're gonna get the biggest but you're gonna solve that problem. So that's one example. That's interesting. Now going into immuno you know, therapy, and, and, and this is an area that I'm working in also. I actually, we know that when you look at the immune system, and we learned a lot about the immunology during COVID, but it's really in the immune system and, and, and disorders of the immune system and manipulating the immune system covers almost all diseases. I mean, you really can that's think true. of 
any disease, transmittable diseases, acquired diseases, etc. And we've also learned, uh, you know, not, I didn't learn this, but other the general public also learned that there are, you, you know, these vaccines that came about, if they didn't have engineering methodology with lipid nanoparticles, there's no way you can deliver that mRNA. That's, That's right. useless. I mean, it's a great biology. They won the Nobel Prize, but they needed, as John said, they needed that engineering solution to be able to deliver that vaccine. And we can take that, I'm not going to want to talk too much, but the same example when we think about re tissue regeneration. Yes. You know, the aspect of trying to understand the microenvironment and applying engineering principles to try to better design, let's say, or create tissue in a lab, and then use that. So, so these are, again, you know, this, that's why this fundamental of engineering needs to come to, the, to medicine uh, today. So that's why it's good to partner with uh, Rensselaer. Yeah, absolutely. So John, we're, we're gonna be establishing this joint PhD program mm -hmm. uh, for the center uh, and within it. So you know, what, what are the critical skill sets that the PhD students need to acquire you know, uh, to really make major contributions in this arena? Right, well actually let me, let me address one thing that Zahi brought up you know, about okay. it, how important it is to be you know, basically right next door to the clinicians. Absolutely. And, you know, for many years, people would come to me uh, when I go talk to alumni and uh, outside of them, well, when is RPI going to have a medical school? You know, and I say, well, I don't think you really want to start a medical school. There, <laughs> if you, I mean, you could list all the issues of how a, med you know, a medical school and so forth. But what it does do, do something better, just have a partnership with a medical, and actually not just a partnership, but a, an actual true joint interface and interaction, a, a center that's jointly run, including an educational part, which I'll get to. But the idea is that the problems, the clinical problems that drive so much of what we see in biomedical research, they're not coming from the engineers necessarily or from the basic scientists. In fact, the basic sciences gives you fundamental knowledge, but the clinical issues from the patients that come back. And, and being directly associated, not just, not just having a joint collaboration or something like that with people at a medical school, but to actually have a true joint program puts us into the medical school, just like the medical school is put into Rensselaer. And so that gives us this great opportunity to identify the problems and look at opportunities to help drive the solutions forward. Now, as part of all that, you know, what really acts as a glue, and Dr. Jackson, you clearly brought this up from day one. In fact, you and Dennis Charney brought it up. We need to have a joint degree. Of course, Sonia doesn't have an undergraduate program, but the PhD program really does serve as a tremendous glue between the two institutions. You know, research projects come and go, uh, and, you know, people come and go, but a joint degree program is much more long-lasting. And, and so that allows us to now bring together the educational component, which will allow new students, you know, new graduate students, and it'll expand beyond the graduate, it goes to postdocs, research scientists, but also we have visions to go into various master's programs and certificate programs and so forth. But what it will do is it will provide a breadth, not only on the educational side, but on the research side for PhD students to come in that could be engineers that want to be working directly with clinicians or med students that want to be working directly with engineers. And, and by the way, I, I use the term engineering very broadly. It, it's not just engineering, but it's really all parts of Rensselaer, and we've already begun to do that. Obviously, the School of Science, Actually, uh, Lally, their program's now linked in uh, on, the, uh, on uh, the business uh, side with various groups at Mount Sinai. <clears throat> and so it, it gives, and, and we're putting, a, a, it's really an opportunity to, to define a new educational program. What the students need to have is not just a typical, okay, electrical engineering or biomedical engineering or chemical engineering program, but you're gonna have something that's intertwined with the, uh, uh, the clinical aspects uh, and the, the basic science it, that lead into the clinic that exists already at Mount Sinai. So we're really bringing the two sides together quite well. 
You know, it's, it's interesting, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I used to be on the board of Medtronic, so when you mentioned the deep brain stimulation. Exactly, they are very much into it. They're yeah. very much into yeah. it. And, yeah. and this issue of, of navigational techniques yeah. and, and, so, and yeah. the mapping yeah. is, is critical, yeah. but here's the subtlety, but this is where I think both the engineering and the biological and the biomedical and the clin clinical work come together, and that is that you, we still don't necessarily know what's happening at a cellular level yeah. and, and, and how that is affecting disease progression or disease stability. And so, uh, but it, I mean, there are miracles that have occurred with the deep brain stimulation, but there's, as you point out, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'd like to open the floor to any of you to uh, ask any question you would like. Yeah. So uh, there have been some uh, amazing successes with immunotherapy for melanoma, I guess some breast cancers and so on. Uh, but one uh, cancer that uh, hasn't been uh, tackled yet is um, pancreatic cancer. Uh, I, from what I've read, it seems like there's also a, a mechanical issue with uh, solid mass tumor. And it seems like that's ripe for some engineering to help address that. What do you think? Maybe I can take this. I mean, that's full disclosure. I have a you know, startup company that's you know, licensed from Mount Sinai and works in the field of immunotherapy and also with Jim Allison here, who's a Nobel Prize winner. He's on our advisory board. And we are tackling uh, some of this. And, and the whole idea, you know, talking to Jim and his wife, Pam, who's also an oncologist, the, you know, as you said, you know, certain immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors have been an incredible miracle. I mean, incredible, really, vindic vindication, really, that you can manipulate that immune system. But it's not enough. You know, as you said, certain type of cancers, you're not getting the full response. You may be getting a 50%, better than before, but still not at the, what you want, 100%. Certain type of cancer, you're not able to even address yet. Why? Because there are a lot to the immune system. I mean, there are beyond checkpoint inhibitors, beyond the adaptive immune system. There's also the innate immune system. There's ways you could modulate one, stimulate the other. There's many ways to do. That's why this whole area of immunotherapy uh, is very rich. It needs many different approaches. CAR-T is one of them, but there's also a lot more. That's why we feel these engineering principles uh, that we're doing, we're doing one a different approach, uh, you know, looking at it. And there are many others that uh, we are also thinking about and not exploring yet because we still need better tools to do this. So I'm hopeful, though. I, I would say, you know, that's why we chose it. That's why we chose the immune system. It, it's really one of the areas that we are betting. We're not betting on blindly on it. As you said, there are successes already, but we need to do better and we can build on that. Yeah. Yeah, very excited about it, definitely. Other questions? Please, yes. Um, Here's a mic for you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, one thing that I'm interested in is um, collaboration with other institutes um, and how you see that developing. I'm really a big fan of the combined joint degree. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. But one of the things, um, that I was thinking about, and this is mainly after reading Walter Isaacson's book on mm -hmm. Jennifer Doudna mm -hmm. and the whole development of the mRNA technology, mm -hmm. you know, that it was a global effort. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to know mm -hmm. your thoughts on collaboration. Well, well, I'll mention something just from a broad institutional point of view, and then I'll leave it to these two gentlemen. Inherently, if one sets up an in a center or an institute like this, it is inherently going to be linked into global efforts because the kind mm -hmm. of uh, knowledge progress, uh, we still will have the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary mm -hmm. Studies, and it has partners not just around the country but around the globe, Mount Sinai as well. And so you could almost think of the center as being a core or a major node, but yeah. inherently it's drawing on and, and playing into uh, a larger 
uh, science, engineering, medicine, and technology frame. And that's how we do science today. I mean, we are not changing exactly, that. Exactly. We, we, I mean, I, any of us, regardless if we have this institute or a center affiliated, let's say you're a principal investigator in your own lab, you know, you have your own lab, nobody is just working within their own lab anymore. I mean, you really cry, go into your neighbor next door, you're, you're, you're having material transfer agreement with this company, with, with, with this other person who is in, hopefully not in Russia or Ukraine because it's hard today, but they are in Europe. I mean, that's how we do science. That's what right. we're trying to do here is augment. That's and we exactly want to bring right. that engineering principle into it. Maybe I say, you know, let's take a side note. So, so the pressure of, of us have needing an, an engineering university or institute affiliation really not only came from us grassroots, it actually came from our leadership, from Dennis Sharney, the dean. He's recruiting faculty members That's right. in cancer, and they say, do you have an engineering school? Uh, because at where I was, I came from the pen, and there was across the street, I was able to talk to the bioengineering department, of medical students. Oh, I trained in MIT in engineering, but I want to be a doctor. However, I still like to maybe do a, a, a special emphasis uh, uh, during my four year and publish a uh, you know, paper so I can graduate with distinction, but I want to do it in engineering. So really the pressure That's right. came from, I would say very quickly when, when, you know, after I came to Sinai, after Dean Charney came, and that pressure not came from us as the engineers who were grassroots people there, but it really came from there, recognizing that this is going to be very important. The faculty that they're recruiting are asking for it, the medical school students are asking for it, and, and obviously they're seeing how science, you know, in nature and science in public publications yes. are using these engineering principles, yeah. John, would you want to say that? Yeah, you know, all the faculty that will be within the center are, are faculty. Therefore, they collaborate with whoever they want to. The opportunities to be able to collaborate very closely from RPI's perspective with Mount Sinai is, is significant because you don't have to go very far. We're going to be working together. We're going to have students that are going to be side by side. And by the way, the best way to get very good collaborations is yeah. have your students yeah, exactly. working together because if it's up to the faculty, sometimes yeah. it doesn't get done. It, 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 it's really the students that drive it and they come up and say, hey, I'm doing this with so-and-so. And it's, so okay. true. So true. Um, and, and so that will be a great opportunity for us. But you know, we're gonna be in the city just like Mount Sinai is in the city and there are gonna be opportunities to link in with other schools in the area. I think it's interesting that apparently um, the, there are a number of major universities in the city. It doesn't look like they talk to each other very much. So we saw that and have an opportunity to come right in. It'll shake up a few things, but that's all right. Yeah. And, this, and, is, this is a unique, sorry, this is a unique. In, if you look at New York and, and having engineering and medicine, it, it is definitely unique. It is not, not there. So. Not there. And, and the other piece I'd like to mention is now, you know, when we started down the pathway with the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, we designed it such literally in terms of its architecture mm -hmm. to, in, uh, to, to support and encourage the greatest interactivity. So it has open bay labs, and, and so that's where the students are. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's not one professor, one room. And, and so these research groups are there, and they interact with each other. And then uh, the other is I, a lot of people worried about uh, uh, such a res uh, focus on research. Well, what I didn't tell you is that over the course of the Rensselaer plans, we have created 25 new academic degree programs at Rensselaer. And either 17 or 18 of them are undergraduate programs. Mm -hmm. The others are graduate programs, primarily PhDs, but some masters. And so out of this high-end research comes new academic opportunities uh, for our students, but academic opportunities are that are relevant to, for today. And, yeah. and, and yes, I felt that three things had to anchor this, this center. One, a presence in New York mm -hmm. with Mount Sinai. And so we've literally leased the space, and you know we're going to be fitting it up, and it's ready to go. The second is to have your intellectual core, 
And so you have to define you know, what your focal areas are and what things can feed into it. So the immunoengineering, the neuroengineering, the regenerative and reparative medicine, but it links to strengths that each institution has. And then the use of platforms. I mentioned the, the microphysiological, the, sure. the imaging, the, the, the data analytics, the AI. And, and so these things, this, this intellectual core is important. And then finally, the glue, which is the, the joint PhD program. Oh. Now, people say, well, you're going to do MD PhDs. Well, sure. I mean, that, sure. that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. but, but you've got to establish your core. And then out of that uh, comes any number of things that are essentially unpredictable. Now, we hope you know, we'll have some really, and we will, we expect some important breakthroughs, but, but it's going to engender so much else as well. Plus, it doesn't hurt to give Rensselaer a greater uh, you know, national and global presence as well. And we think it helps Mount Sinai, and, but they're a fabulous place. Other questions? Uh, I'll ask one on detection. So you were, you were talking about that uh, earlier. It seems like most of our methods is either uh, some sort of a blood test or you have some ailment, get an MRI and determine that it's cancer or you have a seizure or something along that line. So uh, while I have the three of you up there, where do you see this going? What, what new advances are coming? I'm glad, I'm glad you, you mentioned this. Because another area I'm very passionate about is, is sensors, you know, giving people sensors and, and monitoring people 24 hours. Yeah. Not to invade, you know, not to go on your Apple Watch, or I, you know, I, I can, I'm, I'm fully wired, you know. I measure everything on myself, and I can go on detail with you on this. But, but we are really very big on this remote patient monitoring. Yes. It has already shown in the area of diabetes and managing people with diabetes. It's very important. It's very simple. You have people have scale. You have you you get their blood pressure. You check other things, you, you send it back to the doctor, he's been able to see that in, in real time and make it changes. And there have been incredible advancements. It's not enough. I mean, that's why we are investing. We're going to be in working together on, on new devices, um, electronic, what we call electronic tattoos or skin tattoos. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing when you go to a party, you used to get that butterfly. Now we can have an electronic there, <laughs> water soluble. You know, patching, looking at your glucose 24 hour, seeing how it affects your nutrition. We're just talking about food. Why, why, why do we have breakfast? You know, why somebody says, oh, you should eat breakfast. Some people say, oh, no, don't eat breakfast. You should. I don't. I don't. I, I do intermittent fasting. Is it, is, it, is it good for everybody or not? We don't know this. Unless you're measuring it, unless you're really testing this, have a sensor on you. Same thing as you have an Uber car, you know, all these sensors. We do this in, in industry. Right. Every machine out there in a factory yes, has exactly. sensors on it and is being fed to, a, to that data center, knowing exactly when to service it, what's happening. If you have, I, I, I had dinner with my, my angel investor and he told me, oh yeah, my plane, when I, my private plane, <laughs> we, if, if we have a hard landing, there is a signal that gets get sent to the thing. So, so why don't we do this in medicine? So that's an area which I feel requires a lot of new engineering, you know, new electronics and sensors, different than the commercial ones. I mean, app, I, mean I work with Apple, and, and I tested all the different sensors. It's, it's commercial. It's not uh, healthcare grade yet. It's not exactly what we want. We're going to be able to tailor that. Marry them to your phone. That's what everybody carries today, even in countries in Africa. They, they don't have landline. They have phones more than anybody else in Nigeria. And this way, you can broaden the access, accessing in med doing medicine in, the, in, in rural, rural right. area. We noticed during the pandemic that disparity in medicine has been the biggest issue that we have in terms of access to health care. So, so that's why we feel extremely bullish there on this. AI is going to help with these algorithms and, and these detections. So that, that's part of the aspect that requires, you know, microfluidics, engineering principles, you know, the aspect of manufacturing. But all these are within the realm that we can have today. Yeah. Uh, but I think we have to be, we, we have to put it in perspective because you can get a huge amount of data. It, the problem is, do we understand what it means? Yeah, yeah. And that has to be uh, actionable. And, and that gets to, I mean, look, when the human genome was uh, sequenced, uh, people said, okay, now we're going to solve everything. 
<clears throat> and of course, that just led to more things that we didn't know how to solve. Uh, you know, the cost of take, getting our genomes has dropped dramatically. I mean, we could easily, every one of us could pay for it today, right, out of our pocket. Uh, and, but what does it mean? We, we don't know. Uh, you know, when we look at all these different sensors, I think we're kind of at, we're, we're at kind of the, we're, we're, we're really just beginning to walk at this yeah. point. Uh, you could, we're measuring all sorts of things yeah. that we can measure yeah. uh, relatively easily. But I had mentioned, for example, uh, I'll bring the pandemic stuff in here. You know, it's very easy to measure antibody levels. Uh, you, in it, yes, you have to take blood, and, but you can even do it out of saliva yeah, now. Saliva, there's, yeah. there's a lot of things you can do. What does it actually mean in terms of your protection? Well, we don't really know. Okay, but at least you get some numbers. Uh, what you do know is if you're immunocompromised, you don't see an antibody, okay, that tells you there's a problem. But if you're not and you have an antibody level of X and somebody else is 2X, do you go running home saying I'm in trouble? Or you, no, you, yeah. because we don't know what it means. But I'll tell you one thing is, and I've talked to Dr. Jackson many times about these things, is, uh, uh, is antibody levels, well, do they really mean a lot? Um, what about something that's more durable like T cells? I mentioned CAR T, but you know, we have T cells. Yeah. How do you measure those? Well, that's a more complicated thing. You gotta take a, a decent sized blood sample, you got to actually isolate the T cells, then you could fit, then you have to run a, a test to see if it in fact attacks the virus, and so that's not simple. We can do it, but it's not simple. Is it something to be done by a wearable? No. But if we're going to do immunoengineering, that's a target would be really exciting to be able to understand. I mean, John, I think you nailed it because this is again, I think this is the, the culture we have at Mount Sinai because we work with the clinician. So. So number one, clinicians are going to be, they have their, the level of, of, you know, we think about engineering. Oh, yeah, engineering can do everything. But they're, okay, I'm thinking about patient safety. I'm thinking about actionable items. Right. I mean, I took, you know, you know Valentin Fusto, right? So he's the head of cardiology, incredible, you know, worldwide known. We, we showed him one time there was a, something called at Sinai called Lab 100. It's a very futuristic lab. You walk in there, they weigh you, they check this, they check that, they have a beautiful display. Now it's dismantled, but when, when he walked through the, I think, and he, he could make a call, he's like, what am I doing with this information? What, I'm gonna tell somebody who's coming to see me VIP that I checked, you know, I did a cognitive test, and what am I gonna tell them? I'm, I'm giving them a pill? Or how, how am I gonna do this with this information? So really, I think they, they do bring that aspect to us and I think our trainees are used to this. They know that they have to tinker. They know that they have to do it right. They know that they have to use these engineering principles. But they know two things immediately. The aspect of safety and the aspect of actionable items. What am I going to do with it? And that's what I think this medicine environment do bring to us. I mean, they do bring that reality check. Sometimes they're conservative in medicine. You have to push, and that's what we're here for. I thank God. It's not, not in, all, all of them are like this, that's but right. there is the little bit conservative, but we know that. And, 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 and it, that's why I think it's, it's good we have this together. Yeah. Well, also, I, I think, you know, it's an interesting kind of interplay because another thing that's been around since the 50s is artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it really is machine learning yeah. that has helped move it along. Mm -hmm. But that relates to all the data yeah. that we're able to yeah. collect today. Correct. But here's the trick. You know, that's where analytics, AI, but also fundamental science and engineering come into play. Absolutely. Because, you know, correlations are not an explanation. Yeah. And they're exactly. not causation. Yeah. And, and then all of that is not necessarily predictive. Yeah. And so you still have to have the scientific yeah. investigation, yeah. The, the basic biological science come together yeah. with all of these things to make progress. You can easily fool yourself. You can fool yourself. See, I, I, there was a paper published in PNAS, which I hated the title, but <laughs> they did an analysis. It was maybe a meta-analysis of certain AI algorithm being applied, and they called it a crime. I was like, you know, but crime. publishing PNAS, I'm, I'm surprised, it, I'm sure it's gonna create some, but definitely we know this. I mean, we need that scrutiny. That's why we need these basic principles. And we cannot just ignore them because we're going to get ourselves into trouble. That's right. Yeah. The other we don't have it. I have to, sorry. But we, 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 we're training people in AI, et cetera, but we're not training them in fundamental data science. And, and I feel sometimes, right. 
yeah, I feel a little bit, you know, but that's not, all right. We got and, comfortable sometime with these that, PhD that, thesis. Like, this is why we're going to do yeah. this PhD program yeah. because we're going to learn yeah. how to best train the, yeah. the students that want to bring the engineering and the medicine together. But also bringing in things with the the analytics, yeah. the, the, analy exactly. the data exactly. analytics, yeah. and AI. the ability to do modeling yeah. right. and and simulation, yeah. which engineers do yeah. all the time, exactly. and. Uh, so, any other questions here, please, uh, Michael, and then uh, Bob. I have a question that <clears throat> might be best addressed by Dr. Fayot. Actually, it's more a, a clinical comment. So, in, in 40 years, I've watched imaging go from 2D to 3D to fantastic displays. Yes. And I don't think we've spent enough time with 4D imaging. And I think a PhD mm -hmm. thesis that might yeah. be relevant yeah. is to um, use pattern recognition to go back over time to right. look at what's the growth rate of this tumor Absolutely. or how has this changed over time. So there's a ton of data that can be utilized, but it has to be a, a platform that's transformable, transferable from different imaging companies to be able to, you know, the poor radiologist has to go back and measure 10 years worth of uh, 2D. I, I just think that that could be, that needs an engineering solution. No, I mean, so, so I, I can give you an example of an initiative that we've had now for several years. We're going into version 2.0 is what is, is ingesting all the radiology images that are done clinically. So we do over a million to a million and a half, you know, exams in, with radiology, you know, x-ray, CT, MR, PET, ultrasound, etc. These are part of the clinical care. We take them out from the archival system because we don't want to be tinkering with the clinical system. They will kill us. We created a parallel system, and that has two things. It has de-identified data, so that data can be looked at and manipulated and accessed without needing, without revealing patient information because that you need ethical approval in order to do this. But we also ingest the data that is totally uh, has patient information. We link this with the radiology reports. So we have historical aspect you were mentioning looking over time, but we also link it to the medical record. We're still at the early stage. I mean, we did version 1.0, so we figured out the engineering aspect of it, but now we need the aspect of curation, validation, et cetera. And, and, and that's, that's, that's why you need that engineering. You need that's to right. get now more into that aspect. So now you're talking about 2D. So I mean, in, in, in radiology today, we use 5D. We have, we have, we use, we do, can do models of fluid dynamics done now because of, we can do things into the cloud. There are companies that, that are, have done this other than the GE, Philips, and Siemens who are the ones selling us the machine. But other companies have spun off, especially now that you can get data quickly into the cloud and get back the information to you. So they do the 3D you know, navier stoke equation for the engineers in the room that they can do the fluid dynamics. And we get back that data within, within, within you know, minutes. So example, in, in cardiac imaging, you know, using uh, computer tomography, instead of doing an x-ray angiogram on a patient, now we do this non-invasively with CT. But we not only look anatomically, we also measure the fluid dynamics and we figure out which is the plaque that's going to be rupturing or not. So we can now guide therapy, they put that patient on a stent, or put that patient, I think better if you put them on medicine, uh, to lower their cholesterol or maybe change their behavior. So again, totally engineering principle with now full-pledged companies that are giving us data using these principles. Yeah. And, and, and we actually have faculty as well who, who put together not just CT scan data, but MRI yeah, and other course. data all together. And then the curation yeah. says, you know, how do you sort, how do you label the data? What is yeah. the kind of metadata that helps yeah. you make sense yeah. of it and, and create a kind of anthology that mm -hmm. you can actually make Absolutely. use of? And so one of our professors is very well known in anthology. Is very like well known in this. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, he yeah. was one of the creators of the exactly. semantic web. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and he's going to be involved yeah. here. And yeah, we collaborate. Our, yeah. our commu computer yeah. science yeah. department. So. so we don't have a computer science. Again, that now we're getting a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, the people who want to train now in data science and AI, ML, 
you know, they look at places where there is computer science, and that's why we have to get them tied to RPI to take classes there, and they can augment that with the other classes that we will have jointly. So, really important, yeah. So. Okay, so this question is for Dr. Dordick. You mentioned earlier, it, it seems like technology and the pace of discovery is outpacing the FDA's ability to go through their process in an efficient way, which results in you know, tremendous cost and delay. What kind of regulatory reforms or changes might be needed to mitigate that problem but still not impact uh, safety or at least the public's impression of safety? <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a huge question because <laughs> there's been a lot of calls for regulatory reform for a long time. Uh, especially with the FDA. Um, and the nuclear regulatory. You, know, you just name, name whatever agency you'll, you'll get yeah. it. <clears throat> um, you know, there are tremendous pressures to change and, and, and personalized medicines driving, you know, a massive amount of that. There's also pressures to change about how we, you know, how we deal with the data that we get, but that data is cordoned off. And we're, we are worried about patient privacy but you know the risk benefit issues have to be weighed because there's a lot of data that's not getting used because you can't talk from one one group can't talk to the other and then solutions aren't and and so with the FDA um, you know they have they they've been focused primarily on on safety at the end of the day it's safety if something's efficacious fine, but many things are. It, it's really about, are they, is, is there a safe way to get a drug out the door? Um, and so they will do everything they can to look at all the possibilities. And only when they exclude pretty much everything, then they're pretty much saying, okay, we're going to approve the drug. But there are changes. There's fast track. There's, there's rare diseases and so forth that you can do this with. Uh, and, and I think that, that what we've learned from those kinds of regulatory uh, pathways, we might be able to start applying more broadly. Again, what we've learned about you know, the genome to the, the, you know, what, the, what the, the individual patient, not just the genes, but also their lifestyle from when you have all this data coming from wearables or other tests that are run. Uh, if you can pull all that together, then that information could be used by the regulatory agencies to make drugs, to get drugs approved much more quickly. But, you know, you also have to, I think, reorganize the FDA. I think the way it's structured now, probably, you know, it was structured this way since, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. So it does have to undergo some changes. Uh, just like the NIH, from you know, the upstream of that has to fundamentally go through some changes. We know the CDC in public health has to go through a lot of changes, uh, and, and you know, it takes disasters like a pandemic to show that. But and I think that there's enough interest now, and particularly by programs like what we're putting together and and, and others around the country that are bringing together new ways of running or doing medicine yeah. that are going to drive some of those changes. And I'll make one other comment, because I used to, as you all know, head a regulatory agency. And, and, and if it's a health and safety-based agency, uh, the easy way to lose your career is to not stay focused on safety. But there's another undercurrent, and, and that has to do with what kind of capabilities are these agencies able to develop in some of their core staff yeah. and keep up with Correct. Uh, these things? Yeah. And so many times when people talk about regulatory reform, it doesn't include uh, reform that relates to investments in, mm -hmm. in having people have certain kinds of capabilities. Mm -hmm. and, and you see it from my old agency with nuclear power. People say, oh, you, you can't license a nuclear plant because the NRC is going to you know, mess it up and take too long. Well, if the, the agency's budget doesn't accommodate having people being able to keep up yeah. with the newer technologies, uh, the reviews will take 
forever. And so, so, so I think we, we have to think both with regulatory reform about efficiency, but also effectiveness and knowledge you know, transfer. And, and so I, I think those are important. Mm -hmm. But on the positive end, I mean, not to defend the FDA, although Scott Gottlieb is <laughs> one of our trustees who was previous commissioner, and, and Bob Califf is a card carrier and cardiologist whom I know very well, two-time and now FDA commissioner. I mean, they, 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 I mean, Scott have, you know, put in new program to, exactly. to, to approve biologics in a, in a, in a much faster yeah, way, right. adopted new, new statistical methodology like Bayesian statistics, for example, to look at clinical trials, accelerate. Bob Califf have always said, you know, we have to give the power to the patient and, and use that aspect right. in terms of, you know, of course, patient safety, but really be more more sensitive to that. He, he, he's very much into, into mining the electronic medical record or records right. on patient, maybe monitoring also 24 hours to help accelerate some of that. You don't need a full safety on, on all these medicines. Sometimes, you know, you have medicine that needs to be approved that you know their safety profile, so you shouldn't be running the whole Thing gamut again. of things. Right. So maybe you do safety monitoring post what we call marketing now. Mm -hmm. So you push a little bit on that. So, so they, 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 of course, as you said though, but there's the issue of you need to train also yeah. the people working, not only the chief, but no, but, the other but even Scott has been that. rather critical of the FDA. Oh lately. no, of course. He, but, he, but, 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 but I just but will point out, folks, yeah, that yeah, yeah. this is really selfish on my part. The NRC has been doing Bayesian statistics since the beginning of time, <laughs> yeah. and and I do wish to point out that they're mainly engineers, yeah. and so that's probably yeah. where the FDA yeah. learned their stuff. But you know, it's got to go through. <laughs> But the FDA has all these different divisions based on diseases and yeah. so forth and so on. And Devices so, and right. And exactly. so it, it needs to get from, these are great ideas. And, and yes, the leadership of the FDA sees that. Yeah. Uh, and it just needs to filter down. down. And, and, right. and in the end, it's going to be driven by the people that we educate, yeah. as the president yeah. mentioned. We educate that will go in and say, I want to have a career here. This is important. I want to make a difference. Yeah. And, and they're going to realize that they can make a big difference, not because we'll just pass things through, but because we're going to redesign how to get a drug through the market, you know, to the market. Mm -hmm. and, and pharma companies, biopharma companies will respond to that. And, and people do have careers that, that span an interesting spectrum. You know, I think about Harold Varmus, yeah. who has a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. But... Interestingly enough, he went from being the director of NIH to being the director of the National NCI. Cancer yep. Institute within NIH, mm -hmm. and then began left to become the head of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Yeah. And so there are learnings that he has taken along the way with him from those, but also ways he's learned. He and I have talked about this. So are there any other questions? I think uh, if not, I want to thank all of you for... Uh, joining us, but especially let's thank these two. Thank you. Thank you.